What, what we'll do is we'll take the rough diamond, uh, the one that you see on the left there, and we'll uh, place the diamond into a, a holder, a little jig like this. This is an, uh, an aluminum block with holes in it, and I have uh, screws here that I can adjust so that it will come close to the, the diamond. And I'll take glue stick. Glue stick is just standard kindergarten glue stick. So the trick is to hold the diamond ever so uh, loosely with the glue stick. Now the glue stick uh, works like a charm because what happens is the diamond has very high thermal conductivity and it will immediately polymerize the glue stick and the glue stick will actually hold the diamond very, very, the minute the laser energy hits the diamond, it will send that heat through the diamond and stick it uh, very hard to the glue stick and hold it very nicely. So we'll um, cut the diamond on a laser system that I don't have here, it's in another building, and then take the wafer of cut diamond out and polish it on a normal scaphe typical of what would make um, facets on a normal gem diamond. And that's what we've done here. Uh, basically, we've, we've put this particular plate down on the scaphe and polished it both sides so that we can take a good close look at it. When we have the plate like this, often when we make the cut, we're going to try to orient the, uh, the wafer of diamond that we cut out so that it goes across the 111 faces so that we can see the zoning in the diamond. If we're parallel to, 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 to 111, we end up being parallel to the growth zones and the diamond will look homogeneous. In truth, the diamond isn't homogeneous. We want to have our cut be uh, intersecting those growth zones. And we'll take these plates and we'll um, go someplace where we can do cathode luminescence either on the uh, electron um, microprobe or we'll go to the Smithsonian and use their um, microscope-based cathode luminescence unit, and we'll, we'll look at the CL zoning uh, to see where the inclusions sit relative to growth zones. Before we break the plate, we want to document where uh, the growth zones intersect inclusions to see if uh, an inclusion might have an apparent older age if it's near the edge, uh, and what, how that age with regard to the growth zone compares with other uh, uh, position of the other inclusions. Now the other thing that we often like to do before we break things up is to do in situ analyses for carbon isotopes and nitrogen isotopes on the diamond. Uh, carbon isotopes turn out to be a very, very important indicator of diamond, uh, 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 diamond provenance, whether the, the carbon is, is mantle-like or isotopically very light, which might suggest it's recycled carbon uh, from, from organic material or if it's isotopically heavy, which might suggest that it's a material from carbonate, recycled carbonate. And the time to do that is now before we break the plate because the plate holds that history in it. And uh, we, we have the inclusions in the context of the history. We have the, the zoning from the cathode luminescence. And so we can then use that cathode luminescence to guide where we do the analyses and we can get the isotopic composition uh, at, at, at this time. The other thing that we want to do on the plate is, is also do uh, nitrogen aggregation studies. So we'll do infrared spectroscopy on the plate to look at the um, amount of nitrogen that's there and the degree to which it exists as individual centers or aggregates of, 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 of nitrogen. And that's a common thing in the diamond industry, but the plates are really good to do this with because they give us a controlled thickness and a very flat optical surface that we can get very precise uh, IR data with.